Honorable members, colleagues, distinguished organizers, discussants and participants. It is indeed a great pleasure for me to have the opportunity to host today's event. We have a rich ag agenda in front of us that covers many important points for discussion. So considering we have a limited time frame, I don't intend to prolong my introductory remarks and rather save speaking time for our distinguished interlocutors. There are three brief points I would like to make. First, it goes without saying that in the last 20 years, the European Commission has done some indispensable job in its efforts to ensure protection of water resources at union level, whereby the Water Framework Directive together with its two daughter directives stands as an elementary policy tool in this regard. Second, increasing chemization of the natural environment represents one of the most challenging consequences of anthropogenic activities. This fast spread of also emerging and new pollutants combined with impacts of climate change constitutes a significant challenge for the legislation to ensure an up-to-date response. However, it should be noted that scientific advances and technological solutions are at hand and available to support the necessary protection measures. And third, in order to make these zero pollution ambitions a reality and respond promptly to rising environmental concerns, I believe that the regulatory response should be improved allowing for enough flexibility while enabling a sufficient level of scrutiny over decision making. Cooperation and operational support at EU level should be enhanced and the polluters should contribute their fair share. Having said that, water protection should be our common project standing high at the EU political agenda. Protecting water means protecting natural habitats. It means protecting human health. And let's be frank, it is an indispensable means of conflict prevention. So without further ado, I would pass the floor now to Ms. Sara Johansson from European Environmental Bureau to steer the discussion and lead us through the topics on the agenda. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Burglitz, for this uh, introduction and for hosting this event that takes place uh, against the backdrop of the ongoing update of the priority substances for surface and groundwater at EU level. So we have a list of uh, speakers with us today. Um, Caroline Wally from the European Environmental Agency. Uh, we have um, online, Alexandra Kroll from the Swiss Ecotox Center and, and EAVAG. Uh, and as well with us online, Coldo Hernandez uh, Lozano from Ecologistas en Acción in Spain. Um, next to me sitting, Mr. Wolfgang Denlein from the International Association of Waterworks in the Rhine Basin and who also coordinates the uh, European River Memorandum Coalition. Uh, as well as uh, Lucille Labile uh, from Surfrider Europe Foundation and Manon Ruby from um, uh, Pesticide Action uh, Network. So um, a warm welcome to both the, the attendees in, in the room and online. Uh, we'll give the floor first to, to Caroline uh, to give us a, a background to um, the and uh, sorry, and we have also Rolf Jan Hoover from the European Commission. Sorry, um, to give a reaction um, to to the interventions from from the speakers. Um, we have time in the end uh, for a, a, a Q and A um, where you can ask your questions to the panelists. Um, so, without more ado, I will give the floor to um, Caroline to give us an introduction to. Um, uh, the, the state of Europe's waters. Uh, Caroline is an expert in water industries and, and pollution at the European Environmental Agency and leads their work on chemicals in water with a focus on the Water Framework Directive and the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive. So, so we'll Sorry. 
slides? Yeah. Okay, I'm just sorting out the slides. Thank you. Someone running the slides? Thank you very much. Okay. So, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming uh, to this exciting talk. Um, but just before we get going, uh, to manage expectation. So, the Environmental Quality Standards Directive, the EQSD, it currently covers 33 substances which are monitored or assessed every month uh, in about 140,000 surface water bodies across Europe. Uh, this has been done for 10 to 15 years. Uh, the work is done by thousands of people in member countries, in the member states, and we've got seven minutes each to talk about it. OK, so we're just going to get some highlights. All right. Uh, next slide, please. Quick introduction to the EEA, the European Environment Agency. We're an agency of the European Union. We deliver knowledge and data to support Europe's environment and climate goals. We have a network of 38 member and cooperating countries. Next slide, please. And our role is to work with our INET network to inform policy implementation and to assess systemic challenges. OK. Water legislation in the EU, in the EEC, it's got about a 50 year history. It's got a long history and for good reason. Uh, there's transboundary pollution. All right. So if I'm downstream uh, of a big country or a country that's polluting the river and I'm getting my drinking water from that river, I really want to make sure that that country's got as good a standard as possible. So that's a good reason for uh, European collaboration. And the second reason is about um, level playing field for business. So again, similar thing, if I'm in a country that allows me to pollute and discharge all that uh, pollutants into the water, and I'm competing with another uh, competitor in another country where they can't pollute, then I've got an unfair advantage. So there's a really solid and strong history about collaboration at EU level. Right, next slide, please. So, uh, Water legislation and chemicals legislation, they're both sectoral areas of legislation, okay, and they're both cross-cutting and they do their thing. And the WFD, I'm sure you're very familiar, right, there's a lot of uh, le uh, chemicals legislation listed in some of these, uh, pesticides, uh, persistent organics, all that kind of legislation. And then we've got the water legislation, so, uh, the older directives like drinking water, bathing water, urban wastewater, and the newer uh, water framework directive and the water reuse that comes with it. The Water Framework Directive and the EQSD and the Groundwater Directive, this is where we find out if the chemical source control legislation is working. Okay, so it's got a pivotal role, the EQSD. Is, is the, that chemical legislation working? All right, next slide, please. I think just to emphasize, it's priority substances, RBSPs, groundwater pollutants. That, that, all that, so we sometimes think of it just as being water framework directive, okay? It's not just WFD. It's doing a really important job, all right, to, to tell us back. We need to make sure we get this feedback to see if that, net, that, that safety net is working. Uh, just to, some, some people might not be so familiar, priority substances, right? These are 33 substances. There's an environmental quality standard, the EQS. It's set at European level, and it's, it applies across the EU, and it's used in chemical status assessment of surface waters. Uh, in the, under the WFD. RBSPs, these are the river basin specific pollutants. So these are identified by the country or river basin district uh, if the substance is discharged in significant quantities in the river basin. All right, and at the moment, uh, sorry, just one more thing, the, and that those uh, RBSPs are assessed under ecological status. Okay, so we've got chemical status for priority substance, and then we've got these other chemicals over in RBSP uh, and ecological status. All right, that's a bit of a mismatch, and the direct the proposal will bring those together so we get coherence around the chemical legislation under the WFD. All right, um, that that's uh, I think that's that. just to say I think those are orphans RBSPs in came under ecological status are orphans, and we need to bring them across. Uh, and to say just that the EQSD is part of a wider package, and I can't go into the detail, but we think about all the water legislation, like urban wastewater treatment directive, the uh, pesticides legislation, the uh, farm to fork, the chemical strategy for sustainability, that it's EQSD forms a piece of that picture. So we need to see it in that uh, level. Uh, and the, there's a lot of information, much more information at local and national level. All right, at, at uh, European level, we get a pass fail for EQS. So it's a, is it good chemical status or it's not? All right. But the, all the effort and the mesh efforts and monitoring and the assessment that goes on at country level, we don't get that at European level. So for it, one of the big things that that means is we don't know if, if something is passing 
is that good status? Is it nearly good or is it really good? Are we a good place or not bad? We're just, just about there. Worse, we don't know how bad a fail is it. Is it just just failing? So we're actually nearly at where we need to be. Or have we got really big problems? There's really high concentrations in the environment. We don't know that. All right, we don't know that at European level. The countries will have that information. And one of the uh, efforts of the proposal is to bring that information to come to us so that we can, first of all, we can make that assessment, distance to target type assessment, but also make quicker assessment about getting the data, data to tell us something we can react more quickly uh, at European level. OK, next slide, please. OK, I've just put this in because for me, trying to update the the list of priority substances is like moving an oil tanker. All right, I've got time to go into it now, but if we think about the 2013 Priority Substances Directive, the data that we used to influence that and get new priority substances, they were probably collected in the mid 2000s and they will come into chemical status next year. All right, 2024. So we'll, get, we'll get some reporting under the current plans, but they won't get into chemical status until 2024. That is a really long time to tackle substances that are identified as causing a problem at European level and we don't, they don't even get into chemical status for you know, 10 to 15 years. All right. So what we want is something a bit more agile. Like it needs to be robust because it's serious. If something's priority is made to a priority substance, it's really serious for the users, the producers, and the environment. So we've got, you know, it needs to be properly managed with some good oversight, but it needs to be faster. Okay. Next slide, please. Uh, let's see. Okay. So what's really in the water? So. I know some other speakers are going to talk about this, but there are thousands of chemicals in production and use, and some of them are getting into our water and some of them are harmful. We don't know really very much about most of them. Uh, and uh, priority substances give us a lot of information about a few. Uh, priority substances give us a good link to source control because we know, you know, that's a uh, the discharger is discharging this substance and you can say well look we're exceeding the EQS in this water, water body we need to do some action and their measures can be taken all right but there's this thing about mixtures all right chemical mixtures you may have heard about them there's basically uh, co compounds substances can be acting in the same biological pathway all right so but we don't measure them like that so you've got multiple small amounts but they could be acting together and affecting organisms in a way we simply don't see uh, just click please on the slide and uh, on the slide in a minute, you'll see, uh, yeah, this is um, some work done by Vipka uh, Bush under the Solutions Framework Project, where they looked at how many biological modes of action there were in three big rivers. All right, there's hundreds, all right? And we just don't have anything on that at the moment. Okay, we don't have any detail on that in the, in the European level. And the, and the proposal will go in to try and improve that situation. Right, uh, just to go, quickly go through some other things. Uh, that the proposal's tackling. It's, it's, uh, the watch list was introduced in the 20, 2013 Priority S Substances Directive. And that was really great because it breaks this cycle of only monitoring what you know you need to monitor. So that ends, means you only end up monitoring the stuff that's old. All right. The proposal extends the flexibility a bit, right? And I think it's in a, a, a good, good level because you don't want to be too flexible because of the seriousness of the situation. But it's saying for new and emerging risks for the watch list, we should be able to do a bit more. And things like antimicrobial resistance, which could be really serious in our waters, but we don't know. It's saying we ought to be able to do something about that and be able to use the watch list to get us some information at European level. And the proposal also looks at seasonality of pesticide use, because if you measure once a year or twice a year and the pesticides are used for two or three weeks, then you don't know, you're probably gonna miss that peak use. Okay, and that's, uh, that then we lack information about what's going on, what's really a, a problem at European level. Um, another thing I, I think is quite useful with the proposal is that it's, a, it's the way it's trying to address emerging risks. So we've got emerging risks like antimicrobial resistance and microplastics. Uh, there's pretty strong suspicion that these could be a problem, all right? But we don't have the scientific evidence to, to make a robust case for that at the moment, all right? So, when you've got that sort of uncertainty in terms of science, the science, you know, there's pretty good suspicion, but not sufficient evidence to make some policy around it and to make some legislation. So it's putting in a marker and saying we need to be able to do something about this if it proves to be a problem. And that's what the proposal is trying to do to give us that space to do something if something comes up in the next two or three years that proves there's a problem. Uh, next slide, please. 
there is a limit to how much we can do through uh, the European legislation. And here I'm talking about harmonised, and I call this harmonisation is not addressed with reason. But that might be a bit opaque. I'm sorry, I'm a native speaker. <laughs> There's a reason why we can't do everything. So if you look at this chart on the left, that was the that was the chemical status uh, chart from the second of the basin management plans. What you'll see is a red bit down the middle and a blue bit around the outside, more or less blue. And the red is 100% failure of surface water bodies and primarily owing to mercury. All right, and around the blue is like the countries assessed, they, they assessed it and they found mercury failing, they failed. So the differences in the way the countries assessed the information they had, all right, their country experts, they assessed these things and they came up with these different results, different approaches to how they reported their chemical status. There is a limit to how much we can, you know, that's country competence, all right? There's a limit to how much we can do at a legislative level to, to tell countries what to do. We can work collaboratively to try and improve common approaches, but that's country competence. Then the other thing on, on the right you'll see is the number of river basin specific pollutants. Now, in the proposal, there's a, an, uh, a, it, it's an effort to make the EQS at the moment, we can have very different EQSs for RBSP. So one country assesses it at 10, another might assess it at 100. It's a few like that. Okay, It's a few very big differences, not clear why. So the proposal will say, right, EQSs for RBSPs, they should be all be the same, and we're going to have some sort of library so you know what those are. That's, that's okay. But the number of, of RBSPs set by a country, that can genuinely vary. All right? Remember, they're set as the number of... Um, substance discharge in significant quantities. We can imagine across Europe, there are really different situations, different geography, different industry, different population, also a different history. So how many you have may, may well reflect. If you're in a, you know, a rural, remote area, you're not going to have many, all right? If you're in Milan or somewhere super industrialized, you're going to have a lot, or you should have. And so we see very different numbers, very difficult to legislate how many countries someone should have. Right, next slide, please. Uh, so pressures. So again, this is, this is what had what still to do. And I was reflecting for this meeting what we should talk about. And I, if we look at, uh, th these are the pressures uh, causing failure. On the left, it's got chemical status in, in the second LBMPs. And on the right, it's ecological status. Uh, and we put a lot of effort into point source pollution. That's what the one that says point, okay, the, the reddish orange color. All right, and you'll see that that's kind of half of what is there is for diffuse pollution. So point source pollution is causing half the amount of pollution, uh, uh, surface water bodies to fail compared to diffuse pollution, right? Diffuse is difficult, right? It's difficult to deal with. And, and, it's, and it's easy to go, so, oh, you're discharging that, you need to bear down on it. And, uh, uh, but we need more effort, I think, to try and work out, and it's not EQSD alone that can do this, right? This is a more strategic approach required. We can see in the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive that they're bearing down on the, in their proposal uh, on, on uh, combined sewer overflow discharges and non-connected dwellings. So that's, those are examples of diffuse. But I think it could really do with some work to uh, think about more strategically, how do we bear down on these diffuse discharges? Because the point are easy, diffuse is difficult. Uh, I've probably gone over my time now, so I'm gonna uh, stop now. But so just to summarize, um, the WFD and the EQSD, they're a powerful tool to drive change. It's not just about the number, it's about the measures that need to be taken to make sure that the, the good chemical status is arrived at. All right? It's a really powerful tool. And, and it's the way we find out, so it's not just about WFD, the way we find out if the chemical source control legislation is working. So it's doing all that effort for us and it's focused on this EQSD. And that's why it's such an important directive. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caroline, and um, for this intervention, also pointing to the fact that although we're still a bit far from achieving good chemical status in our waters, we're still not maybe seeing the full picture there. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we will move over to our next speaker, who is Dr. Alexandra Kroll, who will join um, online. Alexandra is an ecotoxicologist at the Swiss Ecotox uh, Competence Center for Applied and, and Practice-Oriented Ecology and at EWAG, the Swiss Federal Institute of Aquatic Science and Technology. Alexandra is an expert uh, on risk assessment for micropollutants in water 
um, and on aquatic ecotoxicology and, and regulation of chemicals, including um, mixture effects. So, uh, Alexandra, um, uh, you can start your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, so thanks a lot, uh, Sarah, for the introduction. Um, just one question. While uh, listening to Caroline's talk, uh, I realized that we weren't able to see the slides online. Uh, Maybe different now. I'm seeing my slide right now, my first one. Um, is that the same for everyone else online? Can you now see the slides? Okay, because so we were messaging or texting via the chat that um, slides of uh, her, for Caroline's talk weren't uh, visible. Maybe this is an issue with online and on-site presentation for the next talks, just to let you know. Okay, thank you so, for notifying us. We can see your slide very well from the room, um, but apparently, I think it's an issue for the online participants, but we can see it in the room. Yeah, the vice versa may be difficult, so it, we couldn't see the slides presented on site online. Does it make sense? Okay, no, okay. that's good. <laughs> I, I, okay, I, I, I hope we can, yeah, we, we will, we're working on it. Okay, I think okay, now um, it's working. Thank you. Okay, then, and I'll then let you know when to switch sides, right? From here? Okay. Exactly. Yeah, we'll okay, move from here. Ahead. Thank you. Okay, so um, as Caroline already mentioned, it's a, a brief slot of time that we have. Um, in the next slides, I'll um, focus on quickly a pre of, uh, on a quick appreciation of the amendment of the um, EQS list in the Annex 1 of the EQS Directive, and then making a case for um, more extensive um, appreciation of mixer uh, toxicology in um, in um, water quality assessment. So on the next slide, if you could move on, um, and then yeah, thank you. Um, the I'd like to briefly mention that um, in the past, a group of substances has already been regulated as a group. There was the dioxins and the amendment um, that has now been proposed extends this to the PFAS. We'll see this in a minute. And it also has for the first time a limit value for the group of pesticides. Um, and this is based on the use of the substances. Um, whereas if we look at the annex, um, then we'll realize that among the 70 plus substances, there's groups of substances that group by um, molecular similarity and mode of action. Next an animation, please. And just to visualize this a bit, this would be looking at foodstuffs as a total um, this would be the use of a substance versus classifying these uh, according to their contents. And I would make a case um, for, I'd like to make a case for applying the same principle when we actually regulate our priority substances. Now, the next animation shows um, the, an example of the groups of substances. If you could just click <laughs> for the next animation. Yeah, so on the left, you'll see one back, yeah, thanks. On the left, you'll see the uh, see examples for groups of substances, and on the right, um, the group members. And next animation, please. In the next slides, I'll focus on three examples. Starting from the bottom, we'll look at um, mixture toxicity of PFAS and estrogens, and in uh, the last slides, look at what this um, limit value for uh, a use group really means for a risk assessment. You can now jump to the next slide, please, which is on PFAS. Um, this is just to remind ourselves what the challenges are with this group of substances. It's a large group of chemicals, very complex. Um, it's ubiquitously used and spread in the environmental compartments. They are largely stable, um, which has them uh, owned the title forever chemicals, among others. And we have seen, we see biomagnification in the food chains, and we've seen effects on the human immune system. This is the background on PFAS. And if you move on then um, to the next slide, I'd just like to briefly mention how 
the EQS for this group of substances has been derived. We were, um, as Ecotox Center, also involved in this work. On, in this graph you, uh, or this figure, you see the different compartments that are um, covered by the EQS um, guidance document. And um, among these different quality standards, those that are critical, that are the lowest, get selected to then be listed in the EQS directive um, as the regulatory value. For PFAS, as um, this group, it was decided to, if you go to the next animation, um, to take a mix, mixture approach uh, similar as to the dioxins already included. Um, and this is based on the concept of concentration additivity, meaning that um, each substance adds to the potency of the full mixture. And the substance P4 um, has proven to be the most potent uh, in the effects data and is has been used as the basis to derive quality standards for the entire group um, of, of, of 24 substances. If you jump to the next animation, um, in the calculations, it turned out that the critical QSs, so the lowest critical um, quality standards, um, are for um, human health protection, actually, which is due to the accumulation um, of the substance in the food chain and transportation through uh, water bodies down to um, drinking or up to drinking water extraction. And the next slide, um, I'd like to briefly show um, why um, group assessment, mixture assessment in this case is essential. On the left, um, you can see um, concentrations as these the, the colored um, box plots from different Swiss and Italian lakes, fish fillet concentrations, compared to the standard, um, the new um, quality standard for human health protection, that's the solid line on the bottom, and then the dashed line uh, further up, that's for protection of um, environment, so uh, birds, of, birds of prey, for example. And what we can see is that there is a large exceedance of um, the standard by uh, fish caught in these lakes. And then if you jump to the next animation, that's um, comparing um, the same um, fish fillets to um, fish fillet concentrations to the new values in the EU directive on um, PFAS, PFAS concentrations in food items, which is based on different fish species uh, called species group one th through three. And here as well, you can see that especially the limit value for small children um, in a food basket approach is mostly exceeded. Next animation tells you that um, the, this risks would, these risks would not have been detected by a single substance approach, but only in the group-based mixture approach. Um, on the next slide, we'll jump to a different group of substances. This is the estrogens um, that mainly enter our water courses by agriculture and treated wastewater. And as of now, the EQS directive foresees treating these as single substances, which in our opinion has two different, uh, two important limitations. If you would uh, click for the next animation, we'll see that the first limitation is a mixture effects. It has been um, reported that um, these substances that all interfere with the estrogen receptor act in a mixture. So these substances um, add, on so that the, the full mixture explains um, what we actually see as and um, estrogenic activity in our surface waters um, and we also know that monitoring these substances individually does not explain um, endocrine effects in surface water so here we would also suggest a group-based approach as also shown in the next slides and secondly um, so next animation piece um, all of these, so this, the, the quality standards are in a picogram per liter range, which is a huge challenge for analytics. And many member states can't reach these in their um, analytical laboratories, which um, leads us to suggesting, as it's already included in the, in the dossiers as well, that here an effect-based assessment of the mixtures uh, would be meaningful to complement um, our monitoring efforts. 
Um, the next slide briefly shows you how um, this issue can also be tackled by an upgrade of wastewater treatment plants to eliminate part of the and, uh, input to the waste, uh, to the surface waters as done in Switzerland, where you can see in um, graph A and C that uh, from the left to right, from the first sedimentation, the clarifier to the ozonation step, there is a substantial um, decrease in endocrine activity and progress as uh, endocrine activity in the surface water samples. Now let's jump to the third and last um, example, which um, is um, uh, now makes uh, the case for um, the for taking a different approach to pesticide mixture um, assessment. Um, this is an example from the um, small water body monitoring in Germany that was um, conducted in the past uh, three to four years. Um, on the bottom left, you see a pie chart um, that shows that there is one substance dominate, dominating um, the samples, metamitrone, then there's a large gray rest of other substances and a tiny, tiny fraction of neonicotinoids. Um, and then if you look to the bar graph above, um, this depicts the risks of these different substance groups. And you see that this um, tiny fraction of neonics um, poses a substantially larger risk than all of the um, remainders, uh, rem remaining mix of the, um, the uh, substances in the, in the samples, which leads us to the conclusion that the 0.5 microgram per liter um, limit would um, actually mean that the contribution of the neonics would be neg negligible. If you would use the next animation, please. We would, so we, agree that it's uh, it, um, so we appreciate that um, the, there is a proposal to uh, take into account mixture assessment but then if you jump to the next animation um, again um, the 0.5 microgram per liter would not be able to take into account the risks actually posed by the different um, modes of actions as Carolyn already mentioned um, and with this, I would like to jump to the next slide um, that would show a different approach, which is based on what's called the concentration addition um, model that, or, or theory that's already been introduced for the on the on PFAS, um, where you imagine um, different substances of the same mode of action in a mixture as similar to a, a dilution of the same substance. So this would be similar to sugar and different foodstuffs that you would then add, add up to understand what would be your maximum intake of this mixture. Um, there is a formula that um, sums up the risks of these different substances with the same mode of action to then conclude on um, whether your mixture actually meets um, the quality um, standards or not. And if you would jump to the next Animation, please. One more. <laughs> There's. Uh... So what we would um, suggest is that for the pesticides, they are listed here, as well as the other groups that um, have the same mode of action in the AQS directive, to apply this um, sort of mixture toxicity approach. And um, if you would um, jump to the next, we have a. Uh, made a suggestion as to how this could be covered. We don't need to go into details yet. Uh, right now, this can be discussed. Um, and um, there is already on the next slide, there is already a decision tree available that was adopted by Cher Sin, I don't know how you pronounce this. Uh, next slide, please. The, the three um, com uh, committees on, um, on scientific um, scientific expert committees uh, already adopted a um, decision tree when to actually assess uh, mixture toxicity. We don't need to go through this right now. This is just to mention that this exists. And we would um, propose that this should also be implemented in um, the EQS derivation procedure. On the last slide, I will briefly summarize our conclusions um, where we We'd like to stress that it's essential that we, the current list gets adopted. Um, 
given that small mistakes are, are corrected to better meet protection goals of the Water Framework Directive, and that mixture risks are really stringently um, taken into account. And um, then for the future, different sources of micropollutants, as Caroline already mentioned, there's lots of different sources and um, that need to be taken into account. Um, and what we would also like to stress that a regular update of these um, EQSs to incorporate new scientific knowledge is really essential. And with that, um, I would like to thank you with the last slide. Thank you so much, Alexandra, for your uh, comprehensive um, presentation and also for making it, I, I uh, can say, uh, comp uh, comprehensive for someone without an Ecotox uh, background to understand the importance of addressing uh, mixture effects and maybe not only looking yeah. at the concentrations, but the potencies of different substances with the same uh, mode of, of action. Thank you so much. We will now move to our next speaker, who will also who is also joining us online. It's um, Coldo Hernandez Losanzo from Ecologistas in Acción in Spain. Um, Coldo is the coordinator of the Toxics Area at Ecologistas in Acción, uh, which is an environmental civil society organization in Spain. Um, Ecologistas in Acción has done a number of reports looking at Spanish water monitoring practices, and Cole will present some of these findings in his presentation now. Thank you. you the, um, the screen is yours, uh, Cole, though. Uh, thanks. Uh, hi, everyone, for Spain. First of all, we would like to thank Pan Europe for inviting Ecologistas in Action to this webinar. Our paper is fo uh, focused on the needs of for consistency monitoring practice, and it is a small, uh, a small sample of our work on pesticides. Next slide, please. Well, uh, given that the data we are going to show corresponds to the different Spanish uh, geographic uh, basins, it's necessary to show that Spain has 18 river basins, 18 different ways to control pesticide contamination and a lack, uh, and a lack of uniformity and consistency. Uh, please, next slide. Well, this is the Ministry of Environment's official map of uh, map of areas affected by nitrate pollution. Nitrate pollution of surface water and good water constitutes a high risk uh, for, to human health and the environment. It, it seems sensible to infer that the cause of this pollution is the use of fertilizers in agriculture and manure for industrial livestock farming. This map shows that a large space a part of Spain's of Spanish territory is affected by this type of pollution, which also has negative consequences for the supply of tap water. Please, next slide. Well, uh, this table is the, summary, is the summary of the data on official control carried out by the river basins administration in 2021 in surface water. The no compliance of the quality rules, uh, 25 milligrams per liter, was almost 8%. Uh, for instance, the Segura River Basin was, uh, has the worst record with a no compliance of more or less 24%. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing. It's, it's a high risk to, to human health. Next slide, please. Well, from water data are much worse. The average of no compliance with the Spanish quality standard, this is uh, 37.5 milligrams per liter, was almost 25%. Unfortunately, certain ideographic basins stand out, such as the Segura Basin, with 61% no compliance. Ecologistas in, in Action wishes to highlight the difference in the number in the number of controls among different river basins. These differences are not related to the surface area on, uh, of the basins, and every year uh, change the rules. Uh, another noteworthy aspect is the difference in monitoring between surface water and groundwater, both in the environmental quality standard and in the number of controls, which are three times more numerous for surface water down for uh, down for one water. Next slide, please. 
Well, this is this is the data and the map and the Barialic Islands uh, con uh, nitrate contamination. Uh, more or less, is uh, the no the no compliance is is close to the fifty the fifty percent, and this is quite dangerous uh, because uh, the tap water in Balearic Islands is uh, is uh, it has an one water origin. Next slide, please. Well, uh, regarding drinking, uh, drinking water pollution by nitrites, the 2021 data at the Spanish level shows the following. Firstly, nitrites were not monitored in the 37% of the supply areas. Mo uh, 197 towns with more than a million inhabitants exceeding the limit value of 50 milligrams per liter. The, uh, thir uh, and thirdly, the official census of the National Institute of the Statistics shows that almost 6 million heads of cattle was registered in this affected village. More cattle than humans, uh, the, uh, the human beings. The next slide, please. This has been the summary, uh, the summary of diffuse nitrate pollution. Let, uh, let, us, uh, let us not turn to, pe to pesticides. Official data shows that pesticides were detected in more or less 60% of the analysis carried out in surface water, and the percentage of the incidence of the, on, of the environmental quality standard was more or less 1.5%. Uh, uh, For this calculation, we have used the environmental quality standards of the Purity Sustain Directive, and for the rest of pesticides, we have used the groundwater directive value of 0.1 mil micrograms as a reference value because most pesticides lack quality standards. In our opinion, that is a big mistake and problem. Highlights. First, the lack of affinity among river basins administration in the number of pesticides assessed and the number of analyses carried out. Second, mass of the analytical effort is focused on banned pesticides, while pesticides in, uh, in use are not adequately monitored. Next slide, please. Well, uh, from uh, warm water, we drew the same conclusion that from surface water. However, as already mentioned uh, for nitrate pollution, the long number of controls and substance analyzed in comparison to surface water stand out in a negative sense. Uh, the data are worst. Next slide, please. Our summary in a nutshell. Firstly, lack of, uh, of uniformity among river basins in the total number of analyzed and in the pesticide assessed. Secondly, the analytical effort is focused on the control of unauthorized pesticides. And thirdly, under monitoring of warm water compared to surface water. This would be, uh, this would be improved for many reasons, including the fact that a high percentage of drinking water supply areas are warm water. Next slide, please. Pesticides contamination in drinking water. In 44% of supply areas, pesticides were not analyzed. In 2021, 1,325 pesticides were analyzed and approximately only 20% correspond to pesticide sold in Spain, for which information was available in that year, because in Spain exists the statistical secret that, uh, that not, uh, not allow, uh, not allow uh, knowing the data about, uh, about uh, pesticides. Glyphosate, the second most pesticide uh, the second most sold pesticide in Spain in this year was analyzed on more or less 2,000 times throughout Spain. One free dichloro, uh, dichloropropene unauthorized pesticide, but surprisingly, the third most sold pesticide in Spain was analyzed only 89 times in all Spain. However, DDT, a well known unauthorized pesticide, was evaluated um, almost. 17,000 times. Next slide, please. 
as in the previous cases, the table shows the difference in the, crit in the criteria of different, uh, of different administration, in this case, uh, the health administration, both in the number of analyses and in the pollutants that are evaluated. Please, uh, next slide. The water contamination episode for human consumption in the, in the region of Les Garrigues in Catalonia in 2022. This episode, uh, this, uh, this episode uh, affecting 20, uh, 20, uh, 25 towns and villages. The episode began, began on May 5th and ended on uh, August 8th, more than three months without public uh, public water, uh, with public water for, uh, for the citizens. Two herbicides were detected, metolachlor and terbutiselin. The remedial actions were taken at the level of the water treatment plant and were paid for with public money, which is contrary to the polluter pays principle. Since it was a question of diffuse pollution, neither the public prosecutor's offices was not, to, uh, was not able to establish liability, nor what is possible to prove that water legislation was violated since there are no environmental quality standard for, do, uh, for those two pesticides. Next slide, please. Well, our conclusions. Firstly, rules should be lay, uh, laid down in the Priority Sustain Directive, which clearly must oblige river basins administration to monitor those pollutants in use and include mitigation measures for this type of pollutions. Secondly, all pesticides must have uh, their own environmental quality standard for their toxicity class. Um, and finally, the different quality standard for surface water, groundwater water, and water for human consumption should be unified. And that's all. Thanks uh, for your attention. Thank you so much, Coldo, uh, for this report from from uh, Spain and, and the status of, of Spanish waters. Um, also highlighting the, the need for more uh, coherent uh, monitoring, I would, I would say. Um, we will have time for questions in the end, but we'll go over to the next uh, speaker who is sitting next to me here. It's uh, Wolfgang uh, Steinlein, who is the Managing Director of the um, International Association of Waterworks in the Rhine Basin. And Wolfgang also coordinates the European, European River Memorandum Coalition with like-minded river basin associations for the Danube, Elbe, Meuse and Skelt with uh, 188 million inhabitants. So uh, please, Wolfgang, um, I'll send the mic over to you. <laughs> I'm so sorry to interrupt that uh, rudely. I'll just ask uh, online, do you see the slides? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction, also for the rapporteur, Mr. Birgles, for hosting this important event. I would like to talk about the European River Memorandum and the European Groundwater Memorandum and the polluter pace principle. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. The European River Memorandum has been put out 2020, and that was the year when the European River Memorandum coalition was formed out of um, 117 drinking water suppliers. And the goal is the protection of drinking water resources, like you already said in 18 states, 13 EU member states. Next slide, please. Two years after that, the European Groundwater Memorandum was published and followed the European River Memorandum. So these two memorandums lay down the common understanding of European drinking water suppliers as regards the protection of drinking water resources. Next slide, please. I will not go into the details here, the time is short. Um, you can surely have a look at it uh, in the slides and the presentations which are to be put on the website after this event, which you are invited to do. Next slide, please. So the 
ERM, the European River Memorandum, sets target values, which are maximum values for non-natural substances per individual substance. And it's one, 0 0.1 microgram per liter for non-evaluated substances, sometimes even lower if toxicological findings require that, and one microgram per liter for evaluated substances without known effects on biological systems, including their degradation products. So the position is to set the ERM target values as environmental quality standards and as groundwater quality standards. Also to review every three years because of the vast number of emerging pollutants and the, what has been said by Caroline Wolle and um, Alexandra before, and that the standards in ground and surface water must be lower than in drinking water. Next slide, please. So now looking at the Commission's proposal, groundwater quality standards for non-relevant metabolites of pesticides. Here, the Commission proposal includes four different numbers for different figures, 0 0.1, 1, and also 2.5 and 5 microgram per, micrograms per liter, which we say should not be included and out of this um, regulation, uh, out of this directive. We currently have negligent legislation, like which can be seen the classification of at least six non-relevant metabolites, here NRM, the abbreviation, has changed into relevant metabolites. So this means before the new classification, the drinking water suppliers, which were above 0 0.1 microgram per liter, which is the limit value for relevant metabolites in drinking water, did not comply with the requirements of the drinking water directive. And this is not acceptable, of course. Also, the SCARE, the already mentioned Scientific Committee on Health and Environment, calls for a groundwater quality standard of 0 0.1 microgram per liter. And also Switzerland has just recently passed a regulation which is up for the 0 0.1 microgram per liter for relevant metabolites, for, pardon, for non-relevant metabolites when the water is used for drinking water supply. So concluding the groundwater quality standard of 0 0.1 microgram per liter for non-relevant metabolites we, we regard as essential. Next slide, please. So now we go to the polluter paste principle. Next slide, please. And first we look at the treaty of the functioning of the European Union, the one of the two treaties. It says, union policy shall be based on the precautionary principle that preventive action should be taken, that environmental damage should be rectified at source, and that the polluter should pay. So this is enshrined in the very highest law of the European Union. And looking at the monitoring costs now, first we can say that the Commission's proposal is for 10 substances for surface water on the watch list for emerging substances, less than before and five for groundwater. In the Rhine River Basin, we have non-target screening, and there we see 6,000 compounds, 6,000. Most of them are man-made and non-natural substances, unidentified, but we suppose that they're anthropogenic. And also, we can say that there are 1,500, at least 1,500 metabolites in groundwater. More than 15,000 chemical compounds are registered every day in the CAS, mainly for intellectual property, but this is the development pace for new chemicals, 15,000 compounds a day. And the planetary boundaries are set to be exceeded for chemical pollution to conduct safety-related assessments and monitoring. And here it's about monitoring. So we are talking about exceeded boundaries. Next slide, please. 
costs may not limit watch lists. This is what we clearly must say. Costs may not limit watch lists because this will lead to future monitoring gaps. We had a large monitoring gap in the River Oda fish catastrophe last year, which was a long time searching in the dark for the real reason. And um, with a vast number of unidentified compounds, yeah, that's multiple causes, and we need to have to, to keep up with the monitoring with chemical pollution. Otherwise, we lose the race. So the solution is polluter pace, extended producer responsibility, as proposed by the rapporteur, to allocate costs of pollution to polluters, and instead of the taxpayer and the consumer, allocate costs of pollution to profits made by pollution pretty simple. This would end the incentive for pollution. And also good chemical status from the Water Framework Directive must not be given to polluted surface and groundwater bodies. And if the monitoring gap is too big, well, that's the consequence. Next slide, please. So finally, looking at cleanup costs in waterworks, the Commission's proposal for this directives, directives says that it will limit or avoid future costs of water treatment by reducing pollution at the source. That's what we also call for. The European Parliament regrets that the deterioration of water resources has increasingly led to additional treatment by drinking water operators due to pesticides with the costs being borne by the consumer, not the polluter, which is against the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union. Next slide, please. So we see an accumulation of risks. The technical report of the groundwater watch list says that there is enough evidence of a European-wide presence of non-relevant metabolites in groundwater. Again, like I said before, six substances originally classified as non-relevant were now classified as relevant metabolites. There is already an analytical gap today. There's a monitoring gap today. And yeah, we have these uh, um, not only, um, of course, not only pesticides, but also a large number of different pollutants, which are can be seen as um, persistent pollutants. And here the classification which is relevant for us is the PMT, persistent, mobile, and sometimes toxic. This is relevant for drinking water supply. So the switching to the sewer, the other, direct, uh, the other directive, the sustainable use of pesticides regulation directive, there is a proposal also to introduce EPR, the producer responsibility for investment in water works. And this is a vast number of 30, 8 billion euro per year, future cleanup costs of inaction in waterworks for all PMT substances per year. So this is beyond the scope and the prevention is set the ERM target values as environmental and groundwater standards, especially groundwater quality standards for non-relevant metabolites to 0 0.1 micrograms per liter. Uh, that's the old version. Next um, slide, please. So that's the final addition. In the short term, we need in the sustainable use regulation a ban or better said a reduction of, of pesticides, prohibition of chemically synthesized pesticides in water protection areas so that only organic farming is done in water protection areas. This would be a real preventive action. Next slide, please. So how important is the polluter pays principle? Answer is it's key to allocate costs of pollution to polluters instead of society in order to ensure future monitoring and to end the existing incentive for pollution. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Wolfgang, for um, giving the, the perspective from drinking water providers and highlighting the need for um, implementation of the polluter pace uh, principle. Um, so we will continue down the aisle and uh, I'll give the floor to Lucille Labile from Surfrider uh, Fund. Oh, it's Manon, sorry. 
<laughs> to Manon Ruby, um, who is policy officer and legal advisor as, at Pesticide Action Network Europe that strives to eliminate the use of hazardous pesticides the, to reduce the dependency on pesticides and promote ecologically sound alternatives to chemical pest uh, control. So please, Manon. Thank you, Sarah. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to be part of this panel today. For my presentation, as just said, I will attempt to, in the given time, to briefly summarize the views of civil society um, from the specific angle of pesticide pollution in water. Next slide, please. Um, first, a few numbers on pesticide pollution in water. According to a recent briefing published by the European Environmental Agency in April 2023, in 2020, um, one or more pesticides were detected above thresholds of concern at 22% of all monitoring sites in surface waters. Exceedances of, thre of thresholds were also detected in between 4 to 11% um, of groundwater monitoring sites in between 2013 and 2020. Um, what is this recent proposal offering to address these issues? Next slide, please. Um, regarding surface water, as previously mentioned by the panel, this proposal was more than welcome as it adds 24 critical pollutants with a group of 24 PFAS to the list. Furthermore, the addition of a general threshold for the total of active substances and pesticides, including their relevant metabolites, degradation and reaction products in surface waters, although not perfect, as highlighted with, by Alexandra, was also an important first step toward tackling mixture effect. Of these substances, 19 are active substances and pesticides, some of them being widely used across Europe. However, of these substances, 11 of them are already banned from the European market, and only eight of them are still approved under Regulation 1107-2009. While it is essential to monitor banned substances because of the long-term impact of pesticides, for instance, um, uh, the substance atrazine, which has been banned since 2007, is still found in accidents in groundwater bodies and possible emergency uses. It is also crucial that currently approved substances are monitored under the Water Framework Directive. In theory, all approved substances should be monitored. Acknowledging the practical difficulties of such a, such a statement, synergies between the Water Framework Directive and Regulation 1107-2009 still have to be enhanced. For instance, once biocides, pesticides, or pharmaceutical residue are detected in excess in the water, there should be consistent restriction for placing such substance on the market and to regulate their use. This would also apply when addressing pollution at source. Um, substances should only be authorized for use with standard methods for the analysis and their relevant breakdown products, metabolites, are in place. To come back on the proposal now, um, the total the total threshold of 0 0.5 microgram per liter for active substances in pesticides and their relevant metabolites, as said, uh, was a substantial addition aiming to tackle uh, mixture effects. However, we want to highlight the fact that no individual EQS uh, for pesticides or their metabolites should exceed the total thresholds. For instance, in the proposal, it is the case for the substance atrazine and glyphosate. To ensure the efficiency, efficiency of such a threshold, all individual EQSs should be harmonized accordingly. On the specific case of glyphosate, without going into much details, uh, for which the proposal um, differentiates between surface water intended for drinking water purposes and not, a soon-to-be-published Pan-Europe and Partners report sampling glyphosate and its metabolite EMPA across Europe found residue of both sub substances in majority of the samples. I would also like to add that EMPA, which is um, highly the most common uh, metabolite for glyphosate, was not uh, in this proposal. To address civil society worries and on the quality and the future of European waters, ambitious, ambitious goals have to be set and the differentiation should be deleted in a precautionary approach for the future of drinking water resources. Finally, and very briefly on groundwater, the 0 0.1 microgram per liter value applying to individual pesticides, as highlighted by the SCARE committee in their feedback to the Commission's proposal, 
um, was established in the 1980s. More than 40 years later, this value should be reconsidered through modern analytical method and through toxicological knowledge at hand. Next slide, please. To conclude, with the impact of climate change growing more intense each, each summer, the pressure on European waters is increasing drastically. Ambitious goals and measures to protect the current, water, the current water resources at our disposal are fundamental. The updating of the list, however, has to be done faster and reflect the realities of active substances approved in the European market. Furthermore, special attention should be given to the metabolites of pesticides and to more hazardous pesticides, also known as candidate for substitution, still for the most part in the Water Framework Directive. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Manon, for giving these perspectives and uh, also highlighting the need to protect water as it's becoming an even uh, fresh water as it's becoming an even more scarce resource following uh, climate change. Now I will leave the floor to Lucille Labile um, from Surf Rider Foundation Europe. Uh, this is um, uh, Lucille is Water Quality and Health Policy Officer. And the uh, Surf Rider Foundation Europe is an environmental NGO that has been working on protecting, safeguarding, and enhancing the oceans and the population that benefit from them since 1990. So please, uh, Lucille. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, thank you to MEP Vlex for uh, also hosting this event. Um, we can move on to the next slide, please. Uh, I would like to start off with a few key points to just keep in mind. Uh, we've had a lot of inputs on, on uh, the state of our waters. To... Oh, nice. I see that. Well, <laughs> well, you'll just have to listen to me then. Uh, <laughs> just to keep you focused until the end of the event. All right. Uh, I'll try to be interesting. So I just wanted to highlight that uh, our aquatic and marine ecosystems are facing serious threats uh, linked, among others, to pollution, waste, ext extinction of certain species or impacts of climate change. On water pollution itself, uh, we can see that it is a diverse and far-reaching pressure. Looking at chemical pollution uh, specifically, we know that only 38% of surface waters are classified as having a healthy chemical status in Europe. Uh, there it's showing. Who knows what's happening? Well, it is what it is. Um, discharges from agricultural, from industrial activities or from wastewater networks, emissions from river and maritime transport, atmospheric dispositions, these are all sources of pollution that directly contribute to the deterioration of aquatic and marine environments. And they threaten our ecosystems, resulting in changes in dominant species and a decrease or loss of biodiversity. On that note, a 2018 EEA report on chemicals in surface water showed that for the water bodies with known chemical and ecological status, the risk of not achieving good ecological status increases that by 33% when the good chemical status is not achieved. On top of that, water pollution can also become a major sanitary risk. Clean water is a necessity for the health of, our, of citizens and it is the basis for the functioning of our society. We need a strong water protection framework that will bring benefits for ecosystems, for recreational water users, the industry, and ensure clean and affordable drinking water. Next slide, please. <laughs> Again. Um, so to give a little bit of uh, the views of the civil society and how it's a, a matter of public concern, since its creation, Surf Rider Europe has campaigned for healthy and safe waters. As of today, indicators show that this objective has not been met despite progress and efforts made at EU level. More needs to be done to not only assess water quality, but to protect it and prevent the pollution affecting it. To give a little more perspective on this issue, I'd like to give some key, a key figure that we managed to collect thanks to our community of volunteers and supporters. The users and visitors of blue spaces are more than ever exposed to various types of pollution, including bacteriological, biological, and also chemical pollution. In 2019, we, conduct, we conducted a survey on recreational areas uh, and the water quality data access there. 
The survey was completed by our, our members across 15 different countries in the EU, and the results show that nutrient and chemical pollution was identified as one of the major bathing water management challenges to tackle in Europe. 93% of the respondents ex expressed the wish to be better informed on chemical parameters in relation to uh, the water quality analysis. Now, this data was collected in the context of the bathing water uh, directive in the realm of bathing and recreational uses of the water. But more generally, we can also see rising concern from the civil society. As a testimony of this, for example, uh, we can see the massive work that's been achieved through investigative, uh, the investigative journalism conducted by 18 European newsrooms in Europe uh, that resulted in the Forever Pollution Project on uh, documenting the extent of PFAS contaminants across Europe. So we see how major the issue is and, well, how it's a preoccupation for, for civil society in general. Next slide, please. So why we need urgent action? In the light of environmental and health risks related to chemical poll pollution and given the preoccupation of the general public, the WFD and its daughter directives constitute an essential and powerful instrument which lies at the core of a complex legislative um, body that governs our waterways, as, as Caroline showed earlier. As of now, the full picture of chemical pollution in aquatic environments is underestimated and underreported. The legislation as it currently stands is not equipped to offer adequate protection of our ecosystems and our own health from the risks that is posed by water pollution. The 2019 EU Water Legislation Fitness Check concluded that even though the WFD and its daughter directives were broadly fit for purpose, there was still room for improvement, especially with regards to the way chemical pollution is monitored and managed. Last October, uh, ahead of the, the uh, publication of the proposal, a joint alliance of 20 EU health and environmental civil society organizations co-signed a statement sharing their concerns and recommendation to better tackle chemical water pollution. It's clear that an update of the list of priority substances for surface and groundwater is of the utmost importance, and we welcome this initiative. As uh, my colleague Ms. Ruby said, uh, rightfully stated, the pressure on European waters is increasing, uh, increasing drastically. We witness very tense debates happening across member states, but also at EU level regarding the water quantity and the risk of droughts for the summer. But it's also clear from today's talks that we're, uh, we have to also bear in mind that our water bodies are also threatened in terms of quality. With the ongoing revision of the list of pollutants, we have the opportunity to better tackle chemical water pollution. The Commission's proposal is a step in the right direction, but more needs to be done to secure a toxic-free future. On this basis, we now call on the European Parliament and the Council to act fast to ensure that our rivers, our coasts, lakes are clean and safe for everyone. The revision process is long overdue, and we cannot wait any longer. We certainly cannot let this opportunity slip until the next mandate. Now is our chance to deliver on the Green Deal and its 2050 targets. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucille, um, for, uh, for sharing your concerns um, from Surfrider and, and from, from civil society regarding um, healthy waters. So with this, we have concluded our panel. A big thank you to, to all of our speakers. And I now will leave over to Rolf Jan to, <laughs> to react to all these interventions. It's, it's um... Yeah, well, I will not summarize all of it, but I picked up uh, a few uh, points. Uh, firstly, uh, I would like to thank everybody for inviting me and also for the support for our proposal that I hear uh, in the room, which is, uh, which is good to hear. Um, having said that, uh, a lot of speakers also noticed uh, some points for further improvement. Um, and uh, I would like to react to uh, a few of them. Um, I heard um, uh, information on the use of effect-based uh, methods. Um, our proposal includes uh, elements of that. 
um, and we propose to use it already for a specific group of substances. And why haven't we done that for, for example, the other groups of substances that were mentioned by um, Alexandra, for example, is that uh, the, the use of effect-based methods is currently not really widely uh, practiced in, in member states as a sort of standard practice. The, um, the analytical uh, procedures and capacities in member states really aim very much at uh, identifying individual substances. So what is our aim uh, with, with the proposal is to make sure that uh, for this, for a specific group of substances, we, we gather experience and most importantly start um, identifying trigger values, which means, uh, which is a difficult word for um, establishing when a certain effects are uh, exhibited of a mixture of substances, which you can use as a sort of pre-screening um, before you really start to analyze uh, in more detail uh, what is causing certain water uh, pollution problems. Um, so in the end, if this uh, leads to enough um, experience with effect-based methods, we like to extend them to other groups of, uh, of substances. And eventually that will also lead to a reduction of uh, analytical costs because you are uh, able to screen larger uh, volumes of, of samples uh, by using effect-based methods, for example, bioassays, and then only the one that really show exceedances. Uh, there you dive into the detail and see which substances um, are causing the, the problems. Um, on the watch list, I saw some comments that we have reduced uh, the number of, of entries in the watch list, and that links also to the proposal um, from the from the rapporteur to uh, extend the pollute paste principle uh, to make um, the producers of the chemical substances liable or at least contribute to the monitoring costs. Um, that is something which is not yet included in our proposal, but uh, the colleagues that uh, work on the revision of the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive, uh, they have included uh, a strong clause on uh, extended producer responsibility. Um, and uh, that means that uh, first steps are uh, already taken. Um, depending on the amendments, of course, the Commission will reflect on, uh, on the amendment proposals uh, and see uh, how we would like to, uh, to react to those. Um, that was uh, the the reduction of the number of substances on the watch list is exactly because of the reason that Wolfgang Deinlein uh, uh, mentioned, and that is that member states are currently paying for the monitoring costs themselves, um, and they are very cautious about uh, us extending uh, the number of uh, substances on the on the watch list. As, that are, as those are costs, uh, and of course, they also um, have to analyze the priority substances that are in the proposal themselves. Um, Caroline started her presentation with mentioning that currently the member states are uh, monitoring 33 substances, which are the ones which are coming from the 2008 environmental quality standards directive. Uh, the reason why this is taking so long is that member states under the water framework directive are allowed to exempt uh, the, their monitoring at the maximum for two reporting cycles and one reporting cycle currently is uh, six years 
which means that if they don't manage it in the first round already, some member states do, but uh, not all of them uh, do. So we have the, the, the legal leverage from the 2008 directive to monitor the 33. In 2013, the number of substances increased to 45, and that will kick in, like Caroline said, very soon. Um, but our proposal has the same uh, clauses because it's a daughter directive of the, the Water Framework Directive, which means that the first substances that are on our list will, at the latest, uh, end up in our monitoring data in 2033. So there is a very long uh, lag time. Our proposal includes elements to uh, to move away uh, from this six year reporting cycle, at least for certain elements of uh, um, of the reporting under the water quality uh, under the water framework directive. So our proposal includes <clears throat> a suggestion to uh, two member states to deliver monitoring data on the chemical status and on the ecological status on a yearly basis. Um, in the light of uh, concerns of member states that the commission is increasing the the burden of of reporting on their side we have suggested in our proposal that uh, member states uh, no longer report on the programs of measures as a sort of offset for our proposal to uh, to uh, to have them deliver uh, the, the chemical status and ecological status data on an annual basis so if the proposal is adopted uh, with uh, with our suggestions uh, or our proposed uh, increase of this part of the reporting, then, for example, the constituencies of the Surfrider Foundation will uh, be served in a way that they will have more frequent access to water quality data than is currently the case. And we are very much aware that the the limitations of the the current six yearly uh, cycle mean that uh, also the commission is basically looking at the situations uh, at least six years in the past so i uh, we regularly receive uh, written questions from members of parliament uh, who are concerned about uh, the status of certain surface water bodies in member states. And then the only thing we can do is look at what member states have reported in their last river basin management cycle, which was 2016. Um, and those are often based on data from 2015. So that is currently uh, the situation, how it is. On the, uh, on the more frequent uh, revision of this, the, the Water Framework Directive uh, mm -hmm. has a, has already a clause that the list of pollutants needs to be updated regularly. Um, and um, in our proposal, we have uh, suggested to move to a different type of legal procedure because currently we have a full-fledged co-decision procedure to revise basically the annexes. Uh, of the environmental quality standards directive listing the polluting substances and that just takes a long uh, long time so we hope to speed this up by means of uh, of using a different uh, a legal procedure that is uh, swifter um, there was a reference in one of the presentations on the the risk of cumulative effects of uh, emissions of polluting substances and there was a slide on the uh, the odor uh, disaster from last summer um, we reacted in a way to that uh, uh, disaster by proposing a mandatory warning clause which is currently not in the water framework directive um, a mandatory warning clause for uh, upstream um, 
um, water managers uh, and competent authorities that in the case of a pollution incident, they are obliged to, uh, to immediately inform their downstream counterparts, colleagues to be able to jointly react more quickly to uh, situations like that. So one of the reasons why there was so much damage uh, done in the in the other disaster is that basically uh, the whole cycle of uh, of emergency responses took almost three to four weeks before member states were really uh, up to speed and and trying to mitigate or to salvage what what there was left uh, to salvage. Um, well, maybe I'll leave it to that for a moment because we also have uh, questions and answers, I think. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Rolfian. So um, adding to from what uh, Lucille mentioned that uh, water pollution data is underreported, underestimated, potentially it's also outdated. Uh, so <laughs> it's it's a pretty grim uh, picture, but that's why this uh, update is is uh, so crucial, I would say. So uh, with that, uh, we will move over to the to the Q and A. Um, so we'll take questions from the room. I will just check. We'll we will not be able to take questions from from the online, unfortunately. Okay, so we will um, open the floor to questions from um, from the audience, and I will uh, ask you to introduce yourself with your name and, and um, where you're affiliated. Thank you. So, yes, please. Oh, sorry. No, it didn't work. Ah, yeah. So, I... Um... I am, uh, my name is Stella Velik. I have studied physics and informatics and I am a member of the European Physical Society. And I have um, two questions. One is for uh, Frau Kroll. Um, you uh, speak in your um, speech about uh, mixture, mixture toxicity, about a formula that you calculate this. And you speak about mixture, uh, mixture risk limits. Um, my, uh, I totally agree with you. Uh, you don't have chemical alone in water. You have a solution of this chemical uh, uh, substance or you have a solution of the mixture of this chemical substance. You must speak only about the mixture, not, not uh, a chemical substance alone. Um, my question is, how do you uh, uh, calculate this limit? Um, this mixture risk limit, you have, a, 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 you have a program, you have a risk program, you have the limits from another medicine or I don't know from another science. Uh, um, this is the first question. Uh, and uh, secondly, um, yes, we... Uh, we we fight now to have a very clean water um, uh, in Europe, in the European country. But how is with the other country uh, uh, in the world? Do you work together with them? Because we can do what we want here. If the other country they have a very big pollution in in all the water in ocean and in 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 other rivers, so we we have no results. Huh? It's clearly. So my question is, do you, do you work with another country too? Not only European country, other, another country. Thank you for this question that is clearly for Alexander, but I want to just um, emphasize that this uh, proposal that we're discussing today is updating the substances of concern for the European Union. So that's the scope of, the, of, of this uh, talk. But I will let uh, Alexandra uh, respond to the, the first part of the question. Okay, thank you. Um, so the thank you for your question. I I'll try um, to to explain as well as I can um, without additional material. So I think the most important thing in this concept is this is that this can only describe known mixtures. So um, whenever we try to 
take into account mixture toxicity in retrospective risk assessment, uh, we can only take into account what we measure. And then um, based on this, um, there is an approach that will, um, or there are two different main approaches. One is to um, sum, to, to look at the risk of the entire mixture or the risk of individual groups of substances. Um, and um, the formula that I mentioned, that I showed, is basically independent of these two approaches. What it does is it sums the risks for individual substances with the goal that for good water quality, the summed risk is below one. And um, so how this actually works is that you take the measured environmental concentration and compare it to the quality standard um, that you have derived or that you decided to use for the, the purpose of um, uh, assessing water quality. So, and you generate a quotient, a risk quotient of measured concentration versus um, quality standard for each individual substance, and then create a, a sum of this. This would be the, the summed risk quotient. This is the formula that I showed. Um, and as I said, you can do this for modes of action, as I showed for the neonics, for example, saying that um, although the concentrations are negligible in the sum of the mixture, uh, the risk quotient, the summed risk quotient of this mode of action of the neonics is uh, driving the toxicity of the mixture. You can also do this for the entire mixture, um, but here you need to take into account or, or be careful to consider different interactions of substances. Not all substances um, add to the total toxicity, but there is also potential synergistic or um, um, yeah, the different different types of interactions of these substances. So you cannot always use a linear model. Hope this was. Uh, Thank you so much, uh, Alexandra, for clarifying this. Um, do we have some other questions uh, from the room? Yes. Thank you. Hello. It's, um, my name is Ageli Kilis Maho. I'm from PESA Daxon Network uh, Europe as well. Um, so I have, uh, there's two questions. Uh, they, they are in my mind. One was, um, um, I'm coming back to to the pesticides and trying to measure, like regulate what's safe for uh, drinking water and what's safe for the environment. And then, for example, when we come to, um, it, I was really surprised when it come to glyphosate specifically, which is. Uh, the most popular pesticide right now, and the more we study about it, the more we realize it's not so safe. Uh, so we we found that it is a priority substance, which is a concern, but instead of uh, decreasing the exposure level, it's actually increasing it. So I, it was, in, we have uh, for the total pesticide active substances, you can have 0 0.5, but then exceptionally, if you have glyphosate, you can have much more. So this seems a little bit of a contradiction and why you have it uh, as a priority substance in the first place. So maybe this question goes more to the commission. <laughs> um, and then I have a second question and it's for Ecologisa Senaccion. Yes, please pose it uh, immediately, I think. Okay. So this is for Ecologisa Senaccion and Coldo. And I would like to ask, um, thank you very much for presenting the work um, that you did. And I have a question on how easy it was to collect the data. Um, was it accessible on, on, online? Uh, did you have to do a request? Was it easy to get this uh, monitoring data? And because I think this is relevant for all uh, European countries, and what's the public access actually to this data? Thank you. 
Thank you for these two questions. I think the first one was from for Rolf Jan, so I will give you the floor first. Yes, thank you. On glyphosate, um, we are aware of um, the criticism. The reason why there were two different, or where why there are two different values in the in the proposal. Um, is that we distinguish between waters used for drinking water and those uh, who are not. Uh, and that has uh, a reason uh, because the, the, the scientific literature that we used um, to derive uh, and to support the entire work do indicate that the critical value is the intake of glyphosate for human health, basically. That's why we have uh, proposed a stricter value for the use of drinking water. When you uh, solely look at uh, the toxicity of glyphosate for aquatic organisms, the picture is less clear. Um, so there, the toxicity seems to be uh, not as clear as for for drinking water. So that's the higher value. Uh, that explains the higher value. But there is also a nuance to uh, to this, and that is that the in the environmental quality standards uh, directive in the annex, you will find uh, for most of the substances five different. Uh, EQS values, and those are uh, maximum allowable concentrations and annual average concentrations. And uh, in many cases, um, the annual average concentration is much lower than the maximum allowable concentration, which means that overall, over the year, you need to uh, adhere to a much lower value, but for individual uh peak values there can be a higher uh value uh, as long as you also meet the requirement for the annual average which means that on average the other samples need to be much lower because else you don't meet uh the annual average but we are aware of the of the concerns and uh, i think in the proposed amendments that draft amendment that that I have seen, uh, there is a proposal to scrap the the, the higher value, and uh, once that is adopted by uh, by Parliament in a plenary vote, then we will uh, react to it, of course. But uh, as uh, the colleague of the Surf Rider uh, Foundation told uh, told us. Um, we really hope that the council is now going to speed up its work because currently uh, we are very happy with the progress that the parliament is making as co-legislator, but there has been a complete radio silence on the side of uh, the council. We have had one uh, meeting last year, uh, November, when we proposed, uh, when we, we, the proposal is from the end of October. In November, we clarified and gave an introductory presentation on the proposal and the main elements, uh, etc., and asked them to study it. We've received a few individual reactions from positions from member states, but apart from that, nothing. So it's uh, we really hope that the the, the Spanish will do uh, will pick up this file because the Swedes so far have uh, completely ignored uh, the file, unfortunately. Thank you, Rolf Jan, also to to responding to the question and, and highlighting the need to advance um, from all sides uh, on on having this proposal um, strengthened and adopted. So um, I give the other question to to Caldo uh, from regarding how easy it was to access the data that you have presented. Many, many thanks, Angelique. We have worked in, uh, to obtain data for many years. In the case of surface or water and even the tap of water is quite easy, is quite easy because uh, this information. Uh, is regarding to the environment, uh, environment of, uh, and health ministry. It's completely different uh, related to 
uh, agriculture minister, uh, ministry because in spain <laughs> even uh, even at the european level this is a very very simple very simple but completely completely absurd and in our opinion in our opinion things called uh, a statistic secret uh, and therefore uh, the our uh, spanish uh, spanish ministry ministry uh, love loves uh, loves the statistical the statistical secret is completely completely difficult uh, difficult or or totally impossible to to know uh, to know uh, to know that pesticides uh, are in use in spain uh, in spain and without any uh, without uh, this this data is totally imp impossible to to control or to to obtain, uh, to obtain a clear a clear map about uh, about uh, diffuse uh, diffuse pollution pollution uh, but uh, this is this is not uh, our problems uh, our problem our problem or problems uh, or, pro uh, or citizens problems even the problem is uh, is uh, to and uh, to other uh, to other Spanish administration in many cases in many cases uh, re uh, Spanish river basins don't know that pesticides are in use in the uh, in this area uh, uh, in in its area in its area because the quality of uh, of uh, of Spanish data about pesticide but is the same at European level are totally totally to, uh, totally insufficient uh, totally insufficient and and the amount of the data uh, are many data many data many data uh, are ignored uh, to see uh, for citizens at uh, at, uh, at administration and this is totally impossible uh, and in this way in this in this way is totally impossible impossible to to to, to work not uh, not only for ngos uh, even for even for administrations uh, but and that's that's all this is this is the this is the, the, the this is the map of the map of Spanish about about pesticide data. Thanks. Uh, thank you, thank you, Coldo, and and maybe this also adds to the list of un, uh, underreported, underestimated, outdated, and also incoherent <laughs> data. Maybe Caroline, you would like to uh, reflect on on this. You you are sort of in charge of uh, reporting this data back to to the public. What what is your thoughts on this? Hello, everyone. <laughs> so. Um, as I said during the talk, the, 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 what we get in WFD reporting, the environmental quality standards, we get a threshold. It's like pass, fail, and that's it. Um, at the uh, EEA, I, I mentioned the IONET. So the, our network of countries, it's 38 countries. And they can report into something called WISE SOE, or State of Environment Water Information Systems for Europe. And we have a data collection, and it covers emissions, uh, some biological data, some water resources, spatial data, and water quality data, that's called Y6. And countries can report the actual numbers to us uh, through Y6. And, some, uh, and that's an annual data call we run and uh, the, it aligns pretty much with WFD in the sense of the determinants, the parameters that got in WFD, we've also got that in, in WISE SOE. So we've got about 900 substances and that can range from things like nitrate and uh, I don't know, uh, BOD through to um, uh, all sorts of some pharmaceuticals, anything countries have asked to put on there, that's in that list. Okay, so there's about 900 substances in there. And we make we publish that, we're about to publish the next version, so that will have data uh, that we were able to submit it last year, so it will have data going back to 2021. That's about to come out uh, in yeah, end, of, some, end of May, early June. And that will be, and that's a publicly available database called Water-Based Water Quality. And that's available on our, our uh, website, the EA website. Submitting data to that is uh, voluntary. It's not, it's not a mandatory thing that countries have to do under legislation. Some countries uh, support, send us a lot of data. I can think about France and Czechia. They send us really a lot of monitoring information and they're kind of like our core, our core to sort of understand what's going on uh, because some countries want to deliver us a lot of data. And we're very grateful for, them, for that. Some countries give us rather less, right? Um, we, at the moment, we actually 
it's quite hard. You'll see we we've, you saw the pesticides and water indicator. We also do a nutrients indicator. We do a oxygenating substance indicator. We don't do much in the way of products with those data. It's just the database, which is big, all right, and these limited number of products. Uh, one, of, one of the things we would like to do, because the, 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 uh, the proposal would bring more resources to the EEA to do things with data, all right? And one of the things we would do is try and make this data more accessible for the more general user. Because at the moment, to use the water base, you have to be pretty good uh, at data spaces, all right? Very good. <laughs> all right, it's, it's a pretty, you know, you need to be, have, have those technical skills, and it's not something you'd expect members of the public to have uh, generically. So um, the, we do have some public data available, the proposal would uh, 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 require member states to deliver the, all their data that they're using monitoring through the WISE SOE, and we would make that public, and we would have there be a duty on us to make it more available and products that are more useful to people. That's where we are. Thank you, Caroline. We're um, almost uh, at the end, um, but I will just ask also from from the, from your side, from civil society, and from from drinking water uh, side, how important it is for you to have access to to uh, water pollution data or information. Sorry. On the European level, we, we are mostly operating on a on a regional scale, and and we need dire direct access to what is because drinking water supply is usually a, a local or regional case. So that's what we're working with. And, and of course, we also do our own measurements. That's also very important. I almost forgot that. We always, we have the, for decades uh, measurements in the Rhine and also in groundwater, but also this is very, um, a reliable source for us and to get a, a picture of water quality for our, of our own measurements. Can I add to that, uh, Sarah? Um, on the remarks that Caroline made and also that, that were just made on uh, the monitoring, what, what we hope in the end that we uh, can reach with this proposal is that we get better data, more frequent, um, and that we can indeed uh, move away from the pass-fail reporting that Caroline uh, mentioned. Uh, of course, it's interesting uh, and valuable information to know if water bodies fail to achieve a good status, yes or no. Um, but we believe that having uh, concentration data will help member states also to assess basically the distance to target and thus um, allow di to direct, for example, resources to, to, to clean up uh, historic pollution or tackle high emissions uh, and, and, and channel that or focus that more on the hotspots like the ones you mentioned. If you have a site which is very close to achieving good status and you have a number of them which are far, far away, then it seems very logical that you focus your efforts on, on the worst spots first. Uh, and that is something we hope to achieve. Um, somebody mentioned the very bad uh, status of information that we have on pesticide use. And that is true. Uh, our colleagues uh, from DG Sante that have uh, made the commission proposal for a revision of the sustainable use of uh, pesticides uh, directive uh, have included uh, provisions to strengthen that because currently all what we have is Eurostat data basically telling us the annual sales of certain types of pesticides, but we haven't got a clue of where they are used, at what time, in which amounts, anything. Uh, so any progress we could make, hopefully, on, on that proposal as well, which is currently also being uh, debated, would, would very much benefit also our efforts to basically target um, the, the hotspots first and, and know, okay, here we have really pesticide data that we can link to exceedances in, 
in water uh, water bodies and you can only do that if you know where the pesticides were spread and at what time but it doesn't tell you anything if 10 tons of glyphosate were sold uh, per year in in the netherlands then you haven't got a clue about where it's used and how so that is something we we really hope to achieve through other actions in other legislative areas Thank you, uh, Rolfian, to, to point out the need to for um, not only good uh, water uh, pollution data, but also good uh, substance use data, which is uh, needed to, to also direct uh, the monitoring efforts. Okay, a very quick, no, I think uh, we are, we're, <laughs> we will have time to, for those who want to stay after, but we will, um, I will leave now the the, the floor um, again to um, MEP Berglitz to to conclude this session. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Sara. This discussion has indeed been very informative, and I believe it fits very well into further work of the co-legislators. I would therefore sincerely thank all of the participants for their valuable contributions. I think that we all agree that timing is indeed a critical factor in this regard. The legislative proposal in front of us is already several years overdue. The spread of pollutants is fast and impacts of climate change could further deteriorate the status of EU waters and even worse affect resources of fresh water. Curbing water pollution is a matter of urgency. I therefore regret that the Council under the current presidency has not given much attention to the issue concerned. So I would expect that the next presidency gives a complete push, push to it. It is indeed a pleasure to see, at least so far, that there is a quite strong political will among the parliamentary groups to move forward on the file concerned and even to make joint improvements that would contribute to the realization of the environmental objectives under the Water Framework Directive. With that, I would sincerely thank again all the participants and, of course, the co-organizers, the European Environmental Bureau, Surf Rider and Pesticide Action Network Europe, so for having contributed to the realization of this event. Thank you very much.